All right. So welcome everyone to the community call. Uh, the agenda is pretty lightweight. Uh, we just gonna cover some updates. Then this is uh, to come to uh, ask whether anyone in the community has specific needs around uh, proposal based timestamps. This is something that was implemented. Uh, it's, so it's a relatively low complexity because we could just uh, cherry pick it and bring it back. Uh, a lot of the, the work was already done there. And then uh, Wonderplan will give us a demo. If there are other things that uh, anyone would like to cover, it would be good to, to put it in the agenda now so that we know how we're gonna structure our time. Otherwise, anyone? Okay, otherwise, uh, Tane, would you like to give a, a small update from the team? Sure. So as many people may be aware, we already have an alpha release out of uh, Comet 038, and that basically provides the full ABCI++ interface. So we're calling it ABCI 2.0. Um, and so if you do want to, if you're not aware of it yet, and you'd like to work with us and test it out and so on, we would appreciate feedback on it because once we've solidified the interface, and it seems like the SDK team is happy with the interface that we currently have, then we will probably move towards cutting our first release candidate. Um, and what that means for us is then we'll start our QA process on that release. So then we'll run some large scale test nets. And once our QA process is done, then we will, you know, if any bugs or anything come up, obviously we'll fix them. and. We'll eventually cut our 0380 final release. That's the major sort of update from, um, let's say, our big rocks. If anybody would like to take a look at what we're working on in Q2, feel free to take a look at the subject drop the link in the chat at this project board. We've tried to organize the majority of our work by major sort of results of what we're, the impact that we're trying to have this quarter. Um, there's a lot of investigation, for example, going into uh, reducing bandwidth costs and storage related costs. And as I mentioned earlier, putting the finishing touches on ABC++. A couple of other, couple of other value adds as well, but perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about those things in future community calls. Any questions on that front? Otherwise we can move on. Cool. I don't know if uh, Daniel is in the call, if you want to uh, lead the discussion on proposal-based timestamps to give just a brief high-level pitch of what it is. Is Daniel around? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm here. But... All right. Yeah. Uh, well, it was about the technique, but in any case, proposal-based timestamp is just, yeah, we have it in the blocks of comments and tender mint networks. We have a timestamp field. And all it is derived from uh, an average of the timestamp of the pre-commit votes that uh, help it to decide the previous block. And there is no actual relationship between the timestamp of a block and the real word clock, so the, the, the wall clock. And we propose based timestamp, you propose in a different way in which the proposer of a block uh, uses its clock in order to timestamp the block he has he's proposing. And the other process has to check whether the time, uh, the timestamp of a block makes sense. Essentially, we compare it with our local clock and only vote for blocks that have meaningful, so which have timestamps that make sense to us. Essentially, is that. Uh, the goal of this is to make, uh, we had some problems, for example, when running multiple chains. We had the case in which the timestamp of a block of another chain was in the future or in the past. So some interaction between chains were affected by that. And another consequence is also that we could uh, batch votes better way using, for example, aggregate signatures, because since the votes do not include timestamps anymore, all the votes are equal. So, so have the exactly same fields. So we can aggregate and, and kind of compact them. Uh, I think there are other reasons why this project has started, but we did that in 36. This was about to be produced in 036, but then we reverted to 34 uh, as a result of the problems we had. 
And the question here is, is uh, how, how much the community is still interested to have this feature. And that has mentioned here by uh, Adi, we have it specified and implemented. We need to implement it again because the uh, cost base is different, but it should not be that hard. So it's essentially that. Nice. Thanks, Daniel. Do we have any questions on that front? Uh, at least like I'm um, on the uh, proposal based timestamps. Um, the one thing when we were like integrating it into the SDK before it was all reverted, um, I think the missing part was like mainly all the documentation on how chains should like modify it because um, right now I think the idea was like, uh, I can't remember if it was like local to a node or like global to a network. Um, there was like some variation between the two um, and some of the variables change. And so just like there are teams who are already like changing block times. So I think that was like the the biggest, the most feedback, the uh, biggest amount of feedback we got from teams was just like, how do we recreate the same stuff we have now? Is there also some, uh, do I recall correctly, that there, there is potentially a way to get the same uh, impact that you would get from PPTS by using vote extensions? Or maybe I'm misremembering. I'm not sure. Not that okay. I'm aware of. I mean, ultimately, right now, as Daniel was saying, the timestamp is usually not a timestamp provided by any validator on the network because it's an average or a weighted average. So if you wanted a real timestamp, then, you know, this changes uh, uh, the entire timestamp mechanism, basically. Yeah. But I think both extensions would help with that. Okay. So if anyone sees, uh, sees the usability or the useful the usefulness actually of having proposal-based timestamps, don't hesitate to let us know. This is relatively low complexity, so we could just pick it up and push it into 38 or 39 or later. We'd be glad to support if uh, people feel like this could be of use. Otherwise, if not, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Mark, also for the, the feedback from the past. Should we should we move on uh, to the demo by Wonderten? Can I let you uh, share your screen and take over? Yeah, sure. I realize now I haven't really introduced you to the rest of the community. Uh, I, know, I know there's a lot of people here from different organizations. If you want to give like a short pitch of uh, Celestia or what you're working on or your past, that, that might also be useful, I think. I, I, will, I will do this. So like um, this is not necessary de a demo, as you say, it's, it's, a, like, it's a presentation uh, and I will introduce myself as well. So no worries about that. We're just um thanks trying to share my screen right now in uh like do you see right now but do you see this screen or do you see um we see your yes oh right now the whole thing yourself. right yeah okay it worked briefly over there we saw the celestia uh presentation yeah one sec what about now? I, 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 unfortunately, I don't, I cannot share the tab only. I don't see uh, these option right now. Usually it's there, uh, but I can only share the screen. What do you see right now? Do you see that? I moment. think you're not sharing your screen yet. Oh. What about now? Yeah, I, I did it. I did. I moved it. Could you see a blank black screen at the moment? 
It says that I'm sharing the screen right now. Oh. Is anybody? Oh, wait, there we no. go. No. Now I see it. Nice. You see it, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. That's cool, finally. Um, and I can, you can see the differences coming, right? Uh, when I change the slides, everything works fine. Okay, cool. No, so, I mean, um, there's just one screen at the moment. At least that's, that's what I see. I, I, I changed the slide. Do you see the change? No, it's just Celestia unraveling IoT WAL. Okay. Um, I didn't expect such technical issues to come. Um, I'm changing the screen and it should change, but it doesn't. Like right now it should change. Yes. You see, hello there. Mm -hmm. What do you see now? Do yeah, you see no, the presenter it's, view? Yeah, it's just <laughs> jumping back and forth now. So it does work. Ah. But do, do you see only the presentation or also the presentation view? Just the presentation, the presentation. but it's, it looks like it's a vertical. Vertical. Vertical screen. Mm. But it's OK. You can, uh, we can do zoom in from the zoom options. Yeah, that's good. This works. Mm -hmm. good. Not worse. Yep. Okay. So let's let's finally start. Okay. So um, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present you the I12, and I12 stands for if only Tendermint was a library. And we all know that Tendermint was renamed to Comet, but it's all semantics. It doesn't matter at this point. I'll be using those terms interchangeably. It's all. It's, it's un unrelated to the message I'm trying to convey to you today. So uh, first of all, hello there. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit. So my real name is Khalid Kanonikov, AKA Wondertan. You can see my information here. Um, I work at Celestia, as you can see. I'm Ukrainian building Celestia and I'm proud of that. And I've been a third hiree. So um, I'm working in Celestia for like more than two years already. And when I joined Celestia, this is where my story with Tendermint started. So we tried to integrate data availability into the Tendermint fork called Celestia Core. And this is where my love and hate story started with Tendermint. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't work. We were not able to integrate it into the Tendermint. And we end up with a good decision by starting a new software, Celestia, you know, which I'm a team lead of. Um, and yeah, um, let's continue and I'll share a little bit of story of I-12. Um, so the I-12 is a meme, first of all, that's appeared within the Slack of Celestia. Um, for we've been playing with Tendermint a lot. And um, every time like we found something, some limitation of the implementation and we were like, okay, um, if only Tendermint was a library, that that wouldn't be a problem. And this is how like the meme were started. And um, it's very internal to Celestia, but I really wanted to share its vision and what stands behind it to a broader community of the common BFT, because I'm sure that your community wants to uh, improve uh, the common BFT and uh, we Celestia uh, also wanted to improve it as well. It's a core of Celestia, no matter what, and we only want to make it better. And uh, I-12 is about making Comet BFT better. Um, so before um, we will continue, I also wanted to uh, you to meet Vyacheslav. So Vyacheslav is, um, is my friend, fellow Ukrainian, who is working together with, uh, with me on I-12. Um, like, and working at this point also means like sharing ideas, talking, 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 talking about how to do things, how to modularize stuff. And um, at some point we were just like, okay, we discussed alternative approaches, how to build Tendermint. It's time to build some code and we build a POC for that. So that's a proof of concept that uh, we will look, but before we going to the POC, I will share you um, the current status quo of 
comet and how would we see it and Celestia and um, like just to share some common terminology so we are on the same page before we dive into the POC and what it, what it's, or what it, what it does. So um, here I wanted to start with um, software development principle called inversion of control. And it's, the name sounds maybe complicated, but in fact, it's pretty simple. And everyone who wrote a piece of code understand, uh, like have contacted with it in some way. Basically, you have some sort of API and you give that API a piece of code that it executes. And that API that you talk to is, keeps the control of the code you're giving him to execute. Um, rather than just calling some sort of a method. And here you can see the um, this small diagram um, that also introduces two new terms like framework and library, which are a very common way to describe um, uh, the inversion control principle. And uh, with the framework, you can see that your code is molded into, the, into this framework. It's within the boundaries of that framework and leaves there while in library case, your code leaves outside and it just uses some specific uh, functions of the library that it needs. So here's another diagram where you can see how uh, limited frameworks are for the composability in this particular example. So you can see that like the, the codes, your code from based on different frameworks, it will be hard to combine them to work together. Well, in library, everything is super composable and modular. And um, once we understand what is the virtual control principle, we understand what is framework and library, we can now like look under this uh, angle uh, in the current status quo common BFT design. So here is a very simple diagram that I made. Um, you can see the biggest box is comments. Inside of it, there is ABSAT and there's application with some modules in there. Um, the thing I wanted to, to put in the most attention right now is this loop that is next to Comet. So we all know that Comet has this consensus package that implements that uh, all the consensus and it has this event loop that comes to consensus, uh, receives all the votes, does PPTS, all of that stuff. And it controls and governs the whole process of everything that goes into ABCI. Basically that loop calls all the ABCI methods that eventually went into the modules of your application. Um, and uh, now I will describe you the issues with that approach that IBCI has. So here you can see me ranting about ABCI over and over again. Um, so first of all, I wanted to say that ABCI is not scalable. And when I'm saying it's not scalable, I mean uh, not the scalable in distributed system um, matter, but it's not scalable code-wise. Um, every time you need to add some new feature or change, you have to change this ABC interface, the single ABC interface. And every time you have something to the changes between the tenement and um, app within those relations, you have to change it. And um, it becomes a bottleneck. So the whole system must agree on whether we want this change or not. And I would say it's not sustain sustainable. So we blow the ABCI with more and more new methods, like application specific mempool, like something new, or yeah, like there's a new trust minimized um, um, meta right now, and we want to introduce fraud proofs in there. And this is why we need to like extract ABCI into a separate uh, project that Marco can tell you more about that. Uh, so, and it's only the start, right? You cannot even measure what will happen further. And like just changing the ABCI over and over again is not sustainable. That's the point. And like renaming by adding two pluses or 2.0, it won't help. Um, and the most important point I want to make is it's very assumption based. So let's imagine like how do we go about um, adding new methods uh, to the ABCI. For example, we have like pre-process proposal, right? Like very uh, convenient and useful uh, method. Uh, so like, as far as I understand, like, okay, there, there was a use case that needed to prepare a proposal. We kind of propose it, then we collected the, um, 
the feedback around communities and like everyone says, okay, that, that will solve this problem, this, this, this problem. Um, but listen, it's like, it's fundamentally wrong approach for general purpose software. That's my, that sounds very spicy, but um, let me try to explain you. So like we are making a ton of assumptions about what which use cases uh, will be for and how the tendermint or ABCI will be used. So my point here is that you like we will not be able to think for all the use cases that this proposed prepared proposal will need or what extension or like how how many of them it will cover because okay there's already use cases that th these are not covering and we have to come back to the same issue where we add more things add new methods uh, and change existing ones and we have to again agree with the whole ecosystem about that so the uh, this whole approach is like a loop where first of all you try to like solve some problem you collect feedback you create a lot of assumptions then you went to the okay, agreement, uh, coordination issues. And uh, the whole root of the problem is that like Tendermint controls everything. So this loop that leaves everything, the whole flow of execution of the app uh, from begin block to end block and everything in between, um, it's, it's sort of very totalitarian. Like the Tendermint controls everything, app, app does not. Um, and this is, uh, the ABCI issues. Uh, so next, uh, I would like to mention some common BT design issues that I have um, that I've collected throughout the time from talk, talking to different people. And um, um, yeah, just like phase myself. Um, so one of them is um, design inconsistency. And what I mean by that is like, I worked a lot into the core sources um, of the tendermints. And it feels inconsistent. And it's really like, uh, not important point, like the, the, the way variables are mentioned, uh, where variables are named or uh, like the tests are written, it's like on a very low level thing, but even on a high level, you can see the different patterns are used for the same things. Like mempool design in one way, consensus design a different way, blog secure in a different way. And it, it's, it's inconsistent and um, it's, it's okay. Yeah, for like every, um, like the software sometime has this, especially if it's developed over multiple years and different people are coming, adding more things on top. The point here is that this needs to be still a kind of refactor to follow uh, like same common patterns. And it sometimes felt like um, to me that like I worked on a very old version that when I joined Celestia and it also like felt like I was looking for Git blame who did, who did what. And it feels like, like Jay was, like in different state of minds when he was the, writing this or different st writing that because it, it sound very like look very different, um, but yeah that's that's a small point but I, I wanted to mention that. Uh, the another point is tight coupling. So tight coupling is when um, all, all the components you have within a software are very intertwined between its uh, between itself and um, I don't know uh, who had this feeling as well as me but. Um, when I was working on a fork and I wanted to change something in one place, like, and this change ended up, uh, I would need to change 30 more files. So I didn't change in one specific place, but it ends up in the 30 files that are completely unrelated to the change. And this is like a symptom of tight coupling. Um, and instead components should be more, uh, but okay, let's not talk about instead, uh, we'll cover that later. Um, so another thing is it inflicts forking. Um, this is like the worst point in my, uh, my opinion. Like I hate the fact that we need to fork. And, and, but don't get me wrong. I like like when there's open source software that you fork, you implement an issue uh, or bug fix, you submit a pull request and get merged. That's perfect forking. But when the, the your whole ecosystem like, of different uh, the whole ecosystem gets sharded into like million of forks that everyone is working on their own. And it's, it's very hard to like upstream all of those changes. And, and I argue that the problem is not because of the changes that are people making, but the problem is in the software design that enforces and like inflicts forking. Um, 
like a simple example would be um, multiplicity consensus. Like, I don't know if you heard about it or not, but like you, you have this, they had to fork, but uh, for me, for example, to use that multiplicity consensus, I would have to take my own fork, take their fork, integrate it somehow um, into my fork and make a third version of a world of how the world works. Or let's take an example of uh, SAIS compact blocks or future Celestia compact blocks. Uh, again, if I would like to combine multiplicity and compact blocks, I would have to like go through all these shenanigans to like actually make it work. And in my own fork that the upstream would never actually see because it will be super hard to upstream it. And like you need like a higher special person who would do that. Um, and like, however, I would like to still mention that there is a good um, part of a uh, tenderment that I kind of uh, like is the mempool interface. So the mempool interface is one of the those interfaces that were done more or less right, um, because you have uh, now right now an ability to like use the version zero or version one, or for example, uh, we in Celestia and specifically like Column X6 lead uh, of tendermint who now works at Celestia. Um, he implemented a uh, super bandwidth efficient, the uh, like cat mempool, the addressable mempool that optimizes this bandwidth. And it will be pretty simple to just get an in, in upstream that custom mempool to the, uh, to the main uh, tree, uh, gate tree of the comet, because it's just one interface that uh, cat mempool implements. However, it's this is not true about all other parts of the tendermint. So I'm giving credits to mempool, but uh, it shouldn't be just mempool, it should be everywhere. Um, and another point I wanted to mention is hard-coded primitives. Like how many requests um, you've seen so far about like, okay, I wanted to change this hash function, or I wanted to use this signature schema, or I want to use a different PP transport. Like the and like by high quality, I mean, it's like very concrete. There's no way to swap out or swap in like the new other primitive. Um, and I think that it's something that needs to be uh, addressed um, in one second. I really want to have a drink. Uh, and basically it's yours. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Comet community knows even more issues than I am because I'm not working on that every day. Uh, but the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that there is a solution to, and solution is to like jailbreak the app. Um, and what I mean by this is to sort of give the full control to the Cosmos app, to move that event loop from the comment to the app. And you may say like, no, no, it, it's illegal. illegal. It's, it's very radical. And it is very radical right now. It's even hard to imagine how this would look like. Um, and this this schema right now here is the diagram is very simplified, right? And But it's sort of at the end game that I see for this. And it's very long path towards that. Uh, it's, this will require the overhaul of whole app to uh, commit relationship. Um, but I, I'll argue that this is the 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 trajectory where we should go. Um, and to and I will e explain how to get there um, through. But before, um, but before, but before, let's. Uh, I, I like to share with you guys uh, how um, what fundamental changes on a principle level, how to design a software should be applied to the Comet BFT community in order to uh, achieve this goal. So the, the fundamental principle is like, like modular primitives, like Tendermint or Comet BFT really needs to focus on quality of the primitives. And this includes hash function, all the really crypto primitives, uh, P2P stuff. They should be done with, with the great care, with the great fuzzing, uh, and all, and made them modular and uh, usable and, comp and composable. Um, 
we should do minimal assumption about the data uh, that is getting passed in the time to term tendermint. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. Is, uh, yeah. Should we take questions now or you prefer to push them at the end? Oh, uh, I would prefer to, to, to do this in the end. Cool. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't see the chat right now, so I didn't see yeah. the, the, the Let's do it at the end. Let's do it in the end. Uh, so the another fundamental principle that I would like to uh, see in Comet BFT is minimal assumptions about the data. So Tendermint should not enforce you, you have, should have only this header structure. It should have only this fields. The header should be, the, the user, the application should choose whichever header it wants, what kind of field it wants, because it may, uh, it, it may have some use cases for that. You just, the tournament should just define sort of an interface of the things it needs from the header and everything else is up to the user. And the same goes with the block and other data structures that are in, in Tendermint. So we need to follow something like a single responsibility principle because like right now we can see the consensus doing catching up for, for the other peers. And one may say that, okay, that's, that's a good approach. And you can say that uh, that was a, a solution, quick solution to the point where we needed it. But this consensus should not do catching up. Consensus shouldn't just agree on data uh, that it uh, agreed on. Single responsibility. It's dependency inversion. This more like a complicated, uh, sounds complicated, but in fact, it's just uh, instead of relying on com com concrete implementation, you define a general purpose interface that won't be done right for the first time. But so you try to have this interface where you have multiple implementations for that interface. So people can just go and swap in and uh, make it, that work. So this is the dependency version. So another thing is, of course, composability. Um, when you have multiple modular primitives and when you may have multiple components that focus on one specific thing, this is where a great power of composability comes into place, where you can take the stack of what Comet provides you and just build a completely different application that some person just came in and like, okay, I have an idea, I'll do it. And it can do it easily. And of course, reusability, even the test frameworks, uh, all the utilities should be done in reusable way. So uh, people who are coming to this drawing ecosystem can, instead of reinventing wheels on their own, they should just go and take this and reuse those components. Like me personally and the whole Node team, we had to reinvent some wheels because some of the things were not like, uh, public inside a tenement. But we still didn't, like, even what we could like fork it out and make it public, we still re-implemented them to make them even more reusable. Um, but it's just like one particular example. So another thing is we should do this in like kind of bottom up approach. Uh, we're not going, uh, like I don't like going from the like product perspective, which is super helpful in some cases. But when this system is established where we know uh, who are the users and stuff, we can kind of look from the system again from the very bottom to the up where we can uh, see of all the components that are there and from the very bottom to the very up, you can implement this dependency graph where the up is on the top and on the bottom are very um, low level primitives. And this is, um, will be disruptive. Um, and like, it's it may sound again radical, but uh, it should be done also in a like disruptive but in a conservative way because we don't really, there's a whole ecosystem of applications of building cosmos. We don't want to break them, right? And we don't we want to go to this bottom up approach to ap apply all those principles, um, but still keeping the application work. And uh, I'll show you uh, what is kind of the first milestone would look like. Um, and me and Slava will eventually get there. Um, and this is this is the, the first milestone. We, what we do here is we shard comets into a set of reusable primitives and libraries. So the comet itself is not a monolith anymore. It's a set of primitives and libraries that provide some specific, again, uh, functionality 
where we have this loop, as you can see, the, the same loop that I showed you before. It's now part of this so-called executor. It doesn't matter what its name, but it's executor is very like very simple thing that just has this loop and calls the ABCI up, um, uh, ABCI up, right? And um, it it based and uses the, all those primitives and combines that executor all, basing on those primitives. And uh, the first step um, in this um, in this journey is to implement consensus library, and um, it's the core of everything, right? We we need to agree, uh, be able to agree on bytes, um, and from all those primitives, this is like the central part, in my opinion, um, which we started uh, implementing. And um, we made a POC for this consensus leap. We just sit and designed how we see that this consensus leap could look like and what, would, uh, what functionality it would provide. And you can see those interfaces. We're going a bit more technical. Uh, but I'll try to uh, walk you through those interfaces. Um, the main thing here is you can see is conciliator. And conciliator manages and allows joining multiple concords. In other words, participate in multiple consensuses. So the con concord is a consensus process. And uh, this conciliator allow you to participate in multiple consensus at the same time. Meaning that uh, imagine your node does not run only one consensus reactor, but it can run and join multiple consensus reactor in case you weren't like do some interesting bridges or uh, imagine you are like running a validator and you, um, uh, you want to have some central entity that controls different uh, concords. And this will be very useful for different validators in my opinion. And um, so, the conciliator is this uh, central orchestrator for different concords, but concords uh, in itself is just a very simple interface that does one thing, it agrees on something. So agree on reaches the consensus with other proposers in the set, and as a result, produces a commit for something that was proposed. And agree on, you can see, takes the proposal data and it takes the proposal set and it, it receives the proposal data again and receives the commit to the proposal data. So the, why the proposal data received again? Because uh, agree on is called by each validator over each height and um, everyone can propose their own thing, but anyway, the pro actual proposer will be chosen by um, according to the proposal set. Um, and this is like the first iteration of the interface, how this just simple plain uh, consensus would look like with just agrees and bytes. And basing on that, you can build actual chain, right? Because the proposal data that you give it to the uh, concord can uh, be an actual block or it can be um, a like um, state root. It can, it can like any header data you wanna agree on. Um, and when you join the concord, you can see the join concord is conciliator, um, uh, conciliator's methods. It receives a validator function and that validator function just applies any general purpose proposal uh, data verif verifier. Um, additionally, you can see what commit interfaces, the proposal set it, but it's not super important. Um, and another interesting thing is, is this concord, it, it's not aware about heights. And so you can use this uh, for, to agreeing about bytes, uh, not in the blockchain context specifically, you can use it for other things as well. While the rounds are implemented as part of the agree on process. So the agree on in, inside of it has this um, fallbacks timeouts um, that retry if they couldn't agree on something uh, in multiple rounds until until they actually were um, able to find the agreement. And um, the, the, the interesting part is that this interface uh, can be implemented by other consensus protocols, specifically the, um, 
the single slot finality consensus because it won't work for the for the ghost uh, like protocols, but it will work for the hot stuff as well. And we've been thinking about implementing it on our other proposal. There's an interesting proposal that Carlo made about the consensus. Um, and it it works right now. Like just the POC works. It works in a we implemented the heavy case. Yeah, it does the work. Um, um, what's next? Um, so I just wanted to, like the presentation and getting to attend, and I want you to invite to, uh, to do a few things like let's break Cosmos apps free. Let's remove the control from the Comet tournament and give it back to the Cosmos apps. Let's make experimentation frictionless. Uh, what I mean by this is that when you create a system of software pieces that are reusable, composable, that if anyone can just go in and play in a playground with do whatever, it's in, uh, it encourages experimentations. And this is what I would like to see uh, to build more things out of the this possible stack. And last thing is let's assemble common to library, uh, which is Locktal. And it's like maybe a new meme that uh, will start and you can see the SpongeBob uh, assembling the, um, the library. Uh, that or uh, a set of libraries that Comet may become. And uh, thank you so much for the um, for listening to my rant about ABCI and Comet BFT. Uh, I wish we can uh, start any sort of a discussions after that on how we can improve the Comet BFT, maybe some working groups or anything else. I'm honestly um, I'm very bad at community uh, things. Um, I'm like like. There's a famous example when you have this RPG and you have a character. I put all the points in the in the software, uh, and the community things are not for me. And a little bit of management already, but yeah, uh, that's that's it. And you can go to the uh, Q and A section. Thanks. That was that was super thoughtful. The the presentation and a lot of insights. The, the, the first the Marco, it was on, on your slide with the jailbreak. Let's jailbreak the app. Um, yeah, what's about it? Shall I break the app? Yeah, um, on that slide you had uh, some modules. Yeah. And uh, the, the modules, uh, by modules I mean I meant the modules of uh, Cosmos SDK. Right, yeah, that was the question. Um, yeah, I should have clarified that. Um, yeah, so that's mm -hmm. sort of a, like your app depends on the modules and modules depends on the other primitives. Um, this is the way I envision it. Mm -hmm. Then uh, if anyone has questions, should drop them in the chat or just uh, interrupt me. I do have a question if you could go in more detail about the, uh, the mempool versioning. Uh, it was about the design issues. It was the slide with design issues where you mentioned inconsistency, tight coupling. It was before this slide. Uh, okay, let's open it. Something with this one, right? Yeah, you mentioned it here, and you mentioned that Karim uh, added a, a new a new type of mempool. Uh, yeah, was... the country addressable. Mm. The... I, I thought the Comet BFT community knows about it already. The, the, the Celestia implemented this new type of mempool. It's content addressable. And um, mm -hmm. the, 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 the main idea here is that uh, instead of sending transactions uh, flooding to all the peers you have, you send you don't send the, the actual body of the transaction. You just send them sort of an acknowledgement, like a notification. Hey, I have this uh transaction and where once can just request it from you so this way you optimize the bandwidth so instead of just giving transaction to everyone you just uh request them as you need them so the, the problem with the p2p stack of tendermint right now comet is that it's very floody and everything sends everything to everyone uh that uh unfortunately doesn't work for celestia's use case and we had to uh quickly implement this and I think that the whole community can just uh, um, benefit from from lower benefit or bandwidth usage in this case. Yeah. Got it. Do, do you see the questions, or should I say it out loud? The next yeah, time? I see. I see them. 
So I All see right. the question about the executor. Uh, let's uh, open it. So the, uh, where is it? Um, Uh, the executor is exactly the uh, framework. So the I set it as a first milestone uh, where we take the comic, we shot it into primitives, and we still keep the executor so that we can support all the existing applications in the Keka system. So for example, at some point where we, we are pretty confident that we shot it, the comic BFT, everything works fine. We implemented the executor that, um, Comply, compliant to ABC interface. And we can just take, for example, Osmosis or something else and just try to run over that version of Comet um, so that uh, we make some important milestone towards the end goal, but we're still doing this in like step-by-step -step way so that we can test it in uh, real world cases and, uh, uh, and maybe they receive the feedback about that from the community. And like there are many, many uh, benefits from going through the step-by-step -step approach. Uh, does it explain your question, answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think it does. So it also sounds like, you know, if this is one of the steps that a, um, a later step would ultimately try and be to free the application entirely from an executor or a framework of any kind so that it can plug directly into a framework. Uh, so sorry, they can plug directly into a, a library that, that has these various functions, which leads into my next question, um, which is just, in, I guess in my head, one of the applications of writing your application on a, on a blockchain is that you get serialized or serializable execution Right, um, you get this guarantee that your transactions execute um, in an in an acid fashion. They go from start to finish without interruption, and they're always in a consistent order and all that stuff. Um, and one of the pitfalls of trying to develop a distributed system outside of um, a a transaction processing system like that is that you can screw it up. You can accidentally write your application in a more uh, haphazard way and it, things become harder to reason about. I wonder if splitting Comet into a bunch of libraries and expecting applications to manage this on their own makes it more difficult to write applications correctly. Okay, so that's the question. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I understand for sure this, uh, if the app controls everything, it's will complicate things. But think of uh, when you come as a developer to the to, to write your own application, you you are given with a, a set of defaults. So you start with a set of defaults that are predefined by you that are selected to be the, the most uh, general purpose for everyone. And you just do your own thing. You implement something on top of it uh, without caring about the implementation details. You don't really know what other seller libraries keep, uh, in, in the stack they are because they just work with the defaults. But then as you move forward, you try to build something yourself. You see that, okay, maybe that default is not working for me and you swap it out with something else. So it's, uh, so I think it's kind of solved it. You still have this very uh, low, um, a low entrance uh, barrier, but you can still ha have a very powerful, flexible system in the end because you can uh, choose whatever so, you like. I mean, there's a composability aspect to it as well, right? If if we even if we set our defaults to be like a serializable asset transaction kind of setup, um, when I reach out to other transactions, if they're not using the same setup, or sorry, when I, my application wants to interact with other applications as part of its, you know, within a transaction or whatever you want to call it. Um, it if the other application has a very different worldview, uh, it may be difficult to figure out what happens when they compose. Uh, okay, there is a solution for this problem as well. Uh, in, you can either 
uh, define some sort of a like lexicon, like uh, schema that those chains interact with, it, like IBC handshakes. As far as I understand, they kind of like connect those chains and they understand each other formats. Or you can make uh, all the uh, primitives self describable that's serialized primitive self describing, self describing, uh, so that you uh, have like a uh, like the, the good example here could be I don't know if you're familiar with IPFS CADs, so uh, yeah. it's like a hash that contains the like uh, metadata about what kind of data is behind that hash. And right. But have, like, now, uh, we're, now we're now we're trying to have self-describing like consistency models. If, for example, not all applications use um, well, not all applications necessarily use consensus at all. For example, and that's I mean that lexicon is not even well understood in the academic literature, let alone trying to formalize it in a way that we expect developers to understand. I I think we're. Um, I think the, the the problem like you're describing is not necessarily like a um, an issue with like serializable transactions per se because it's more of like I'd say an application issue because like um, I think IBC here is like kind of more or less like the best answer like if you do a handshake with a solo machine like you just define that like hey like. I, these are the trust assumptions I make about your chain. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like more so about like the like client verification than um, which like in this scenario could be defined by the application or um, I, I know, yeah, it could be defined by the application. I think like the potential like best way to describe what, um, I mean, some, some people might dislike me for saying this, but like um, I think like Substrate has the best abstractions of like the, the lower consensus layers and of the application layer. Um, they have like what you end up here is like I, I think like what the primitives here being proposed are maybe like for like a super advanced user, but I think like for the basics, it's going to be like oh, like here you go, um, like a reactor and you implement your like consensus and your and like the reactor does like P2P messaging and is like the underlying consensus but it's like if you use tendermint hot stuff hot stuff two phase whatever it's like the underlying library doesn't care about that part it just cares that like hey i just have to guarantee p2p messages um yeah that much I, is true certainly yeah um quick question from my side just if that question is kind of over if you have more isaac no, no go for it um, so like, uh, you're, uh, Hlib, you're proposing like a design where it's like the application is telling the, uh, let's say consensus layer, uh, what it does and when to do it and stuff like that. But why, um, like I'm guessing in this scenario, it's like the application says propose a block and then everyone, like every, every validator and every node of the network is basically pulling the connection to see when a new block comes in. Um, uh, it, do you, have you thought of like trade-offs between like just having like a bi-directional stream where it's like the application can send stuff to comment like what transactions to broadcast in the network and stuff like this or what to broadcast in the network and like and then comment when the, when comment does like the steps of consensus then it just tells the application like hey I just proposed a block now uh, process proposal and then it's like okay now I'm at the stage of vote extensions I need this information from you. Have you thought of like the trade-offs there? Um, so again, let me rephrase your question to uh, to understand that I understand it correctly. Um, we, what you're saying is, application sends transactions to the mempool, right, and then it uh, awaits uh, ready a proposed block from the common BFT layer. And you're asking me whether I thought about the um, this approach or not, um, right? Again, Sorry. yeah, yeah. By up mempool and then uh, from the uh, the consensus 
uh, gives you the, the result. Uh, I, I would say this approach that I'm saying is sort of a, like encompasses what you say. Uh, so like if you think about this agree on and some layer that comes on top of the agree on, um, you can think uh, it's so that, that, that layer takes the transaction from the mempool or from the like basically from the mempool because like apps app would write those transactions in the mempool the way I see it and then that layer on top takes those transactions and executes them to uh, compo like com composes a block agrees on that block and returns it up to the uh, to the application uh, and those I see those things happening like uh, asynchronously sort of like the the mempool uh, uh, being filled up with transactions coming from the app and the that actual loop that uh, takes the elder mempool transaction uh, maybe according to some query or like I don't know like uh, uh, ordered by the amount of gas they used. Uh, you take all this transaction, compose a block, you give it to the agree on or something like that. And you take the block back and you store it or do something else. Um, yeah, I, 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 the way I understand your question, it's it's sort of the same. It's maybe not just in, in a stream, as you said, it's not a, just like a byte stream or the way you see the stream here, but it's, it's the same where the, the feedback where you app talks to um, to the mempool and consensus and consensus reports back with here's the agreement I got on the post transaction. Yeah, I, I, I think they, they do overlap. I think that the, I guess it's more of like an implementation detail. Like when you, when you do it your way, it's more like the application is pulling for what's next. Like, um, is the, it doesn't know if it's like the end of the block or if it's the middle of the block. Um, it's just waiting for like an answer from uh, from comment. Um, and so like uh, like in the bidirectional way, it's like comment can still tell the application, hey, I'm in this phase. This is what you should be doing to be ready um, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Like we can discuss this uh, like uh, I like this, this one of my favorite topics to to run about and discuss. So um, I like it would be maybe I'll be glad to have some 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 uh, discourse initiated about that. Uh, like the problem is it's this approach is very radical. I would say to current comment DFT, and I, I'm not sure how to fit this. And should it be like a separate project? Should we like somehow try to find the middle ground between that? Um, yeah. I don't know. Um. Yeah, uh, that's the golden question. I think we'll, we'll try to have a follow up with you. So next week in the community call, we're going to talk with the uh, Rollkit team, but then maybe the not next week, next instance, which is in two weeks, but then four weeks from now, we could kind of come back and revisit a bit yours and we'll, we'll let also the, the core developers of Comet kind of think about this and try to pave a path on a way in which we can incrementally move towards more of this uh, design that you're proposing. Can already, I think some of us can already see some small steps that we could do, uh, but this could be like yeah. a concrete next action. Awesome. And in the meantime, we can also talk, there's a discussion that Marco opened this inverted APCI interface in the Comet repo that, that could be a place to host part of these discussions. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Cool. Agreed, yeah. Thanks so much for the presentation. I think the, we yeah, will definitely follow up on this again. We are looking for, I mean, if, 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 if others also have ideas as to um, architectural changes they'd like to see in Comet over time, we'd be very interested to hear about that. Specifically because we were trying to target a, a, a group of users that I don't think was actually targeted with the original Tenement Core development because it was kind of designed as this batteries included consensus engine. Um, and now it seems like people want to do a lot more and a lot more complex stuff with the system. And so we want to try and plot out a trajectory from where we are now to something that is usable by a wider range of users and a wider range of use cases. And to be able to get there, we, would, we need to start to converge on what is an appropriate interface for the the next sort of major revision 
of, of Comet to, to look like? You know, what, what should that interface look like? And what should the interaction model look like between the consensus engine and the application? And uh, as I said, if anybody else has any uh, interesting uh, insights or any feedback they'd like to share with us, we're very interested to hear from you about your particular use case. Yeah, let's uh, let's thank Wondertan for this for engaging presentation and for his time and the insights. Yeah, thanks very much. All right. Thank you.